Hello students, today we will discuss what I think will be our last topic on the endocrine system. Hooray. And that's going to be adrenal insufficiency. We're going to explore what happens when the adrenal glands don't produce sufficient quantities of their hormones, specifically the adrenal cortex. Before we begin, we'll have to first review the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. We discussed this in, in the last lecture, so let's bring that image up again. And so here we have our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this axis produces cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Just as a review, hypothalamus produces corticotropin releasing hormone. That hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. However, it also, what we haven't mentioned before, but will become important in this lecture, the precursor to ACTH is a pre-ACTH, and so that's going to become important. So the anterior pituitary secretes pre-ACTH, which is converted to ACTH, and the ACTH stimulates the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. And then, just as before with hypercortisolism, as we discussed before, cortisol is a stress hormone. Not only is it produced in response to stress, but it also prepares the body for a stressed state, or it keeps the body in a stressed state. Stress hormones can be good and they can be bad. You want to think about it like this. Think of stress hormones as an airbag. If you're driving your car and you have an accident, then your airbag is going to deploy. That's going to be very good for you because that's going to protect you. And that's what stress hormones do. They protect you. However, if you're just driving down the street and your and your car suddenly has that thought, I was in an accident last week, I'm going to deploy my airbag. And every time you drove five feet, your airbag deployed, you know, that would become damaging to you. And that's what stress hormones are like. If you if you continually secrete these stress hormones, they're going to cause more damage to the body than good. In their proper place, stress hormones can be good. But if overused or over secreted, you know, they can cause a problem. So in an ideal situation, stress hormones are good. Cortisol is a long-term stress hormone, and so it's only secreted when there's been a problem for a prolonged period of time. And so what cortisol is going to do is going to cause a breakdown of your muscles and fat to produce your energy. And so it's going to simulate gluconeogenesis, or the production of glucose from your muscle and your fat. And so in this way, you're going to produce the glucose you need rather than getting the glucose out of the blood or getting the glucose that you've eaten. And so gluconeogenesis is going to cause the production of your glucose from your fat and your muscles. Two things that we have not mentioned before is the regulation of this axis. Just as before, once cortisol is produced, it will signal to the anterior pituitary and to the hypothalamus that there's enough cortisol so that the hypothalamus can cease secreting CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, and the anterior pituitary can cease synthesis of ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And so there's a negative feedback of cortisol on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. And this makes sense, because once there are sufficient levels of cortisol, you don't want to keep stimulating its production. Now let's discuss what can happen to cause this axis to not produce cortisol. In the first situation, let's deal with the adrenal cortex directly. There are lots of ways that the adrenal cortex can be affected to decrease its synthesis of cortisol, but we're only going to talk about one of them for now. In the first situation, the immune system can actually create antibodies that destroy the adrenal cortex and prevent its production of cortisol. Let's indicate that one here. In this first situation, the immune system produces an autoantibody. These antibodies go and bind to the adrenal cortex and damage it and prevent the adrenal cortex from producing cortisol. This is the first way that we can reduce the production of cortisol. The second method involves the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary can become diseased and prevent its production of ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And so we're going to indicate that one here. In this situation, we have a diseased anterior pituitary. And once diseased, the anterior pituitary cannot secrete ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And with no ACTH, there's no stimulation of the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. And so in both of these situations, we have insufficient levels of cortisol. Let's look back at the autoimmune disease. Because this one affects the adrenal cortex directly, we call this a primary adrenal insufficiency. And because the one involving the anterior pituitary affects cortisol production indirectly, we call this a secondary adrenal insufficiency. And so let's indicate these two.
So in the first case here, we have a primary adrenal insufficiency when there's a direct effect on the adrenal cortex. And in the second case, it's called a secondary adrenal insufficiency if the anterior pituitary is affected. Adrenal insufficiency not only affects cortisol production, but it also affects the production of another hormone, and that hormone is aldosterone. The primary physiological response of aldosterone is the maintenance of normal blood pressure. So let's indicate that here. As I mentioned before, the adrenal cortex also produces aldosterone, and the main function of aldosterone is the maintenance of blood pressure. And so these are the two hormones involved in adrenal insufficiency, cortisol and aldosterone. And we see the two methods, or two of the methods, by which these levels are decreased, primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Now let's talk about what happens to these hormone levels with each of these situations. With secondary adrenal insufficiency, if the anterior pituitary is diseased, we get no adrenal corticotropic hormone. And since we get no adrenal corticotropic hormone, there's no stimulation of the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. And so we also get no cortisol. So with secondary adrenal insufficiency, we get no ACTH and we get no cortisol. In primary adrenal insufficiency, the adrenal cortex is directly affected. And so we get no production of cortisol. This is where our negative feedback comes into play. Because there's no production of cortisol, there's no negative feedback on the anterior pituitary. And so the anterior pituitary produces an excess amount of the pre-ACTH and the ACTH in an attempt to wake the adrenal cortex up to make more cortisol. But this never happens. And so in this situation, with primary adrenal insufficiency, we get excess pre-ACTH and excess ACTH. That will become important later. We'll talk about that later. And so the difference is, with secondary adrenal insufficiency, we get low levels of ACTH and low levels of cortisol. With primary adrenal insufficiency, we get low levels of cortisol, but high levels of pre-ACTH and ACTH. Now that we see the endocrinological basis for adrenal insufficiency, Let's next look at some of the symptoms. And so for this, we will need the human form. Shown here are the symptoms associated with adrenal insufficiency. Let's go over these. Most of these should make sense based on the endocrinology. Let's discuss the low blood pressure. This one should make sense. You're going to have low blood pressure because there are insufficient levels of aldosterone. And so aldosterone maintains the blood pressure. And so without the aldosterone, there is going to be low blood pressure. The second one related to this is dizziness upon standing. And this is because the blood pressure is low. The third one, hypoglycemia. You're going to have hypoglycemia because you, you don't have the cortisol to produce energy through gluconeogenesis. And so the blood glucose level is going to be very low. Related to the hypoglycemia is going to be muscle weakness. The muscles are going to be weak because you have insufficient energy. Also related to this one is fatigue. You're going to be tired because you don't have sufficient energy. And the last one, this is one that cannot be extrapolated from the information so far. It's going to be the bronzing of the skin or hyperpigmentation of the skin. Now let's explain why that one happens. Remember, with primary adrenal insufficiency, you have no cortisol being produced. And so without the cortisol, there's no negative feedback on the anterior pituitary. And so the anterior pituitary is thinking to itself, oh, I'm not producing enough ACTH to cause the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. And so the anterior pituitary is going to secrete excess ACTH in an attempt to get the adrenal cortex to produce more cortisol. However, this never happens, and so the levels of ACTH rise. Also, the levels of pre-ACTH rise, pre-adrenal corticotropic hormone. This pre-ACTH is also the precursor to melanocyte stimulating hormone. And so this hormone causes the melanocytes to produce melanin, the primary pigment for our skin. So let's indicate that one here. So the excess levels of pre-adrenal corticotropic hormone lead to excess levels of melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH. And this causes a hyperpigmentation of the skin.
as before with hypercortisolism, there's a common name given to this pathology. And this one is called Addison's disease. And so adrenal insufficiency is also known as Addison's disease. And so this completes our discussion of adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. And it also completes our last lecture on the endocrine system. And it also completes this lecture. I hope that you've learned a lot.